Uh, we're delighted to have Elizabeth Scott with us today. She writes poems for kids, mostly for children, and she's currently working on a book to be illustrated by Susan Yantis. Uh, she's been published, uh, had articles published in uh, the Christian Science Monitor, the Asian Wall Street Journal, and the Journal of Commerce in New York. So, ladies and gentlemen, please lend your ears to Elizabeth Scott. Thank you, and I also wanted to make a thanks to Council Member Lakata for including the arts a little bit in our everyday life. The poem I'm going to read is quite short. It's called Sleeping Beneath the Sky, and it's for my daughter, who's now one who's celebrating her first Lunar New Year. The dragon ate the moon in bites while rocking you to sleep this night. Once asleep so contently, baby breathes, sighing gently. Dreams of peaches, plums, and pears are brought to you by panda bears. Woven gold in blankets threads keep you warm from toe to head. From deepest night your sky turns violet, the waking dawn changing scarlet. As you find the gift of day, now your dragon flies away. Soon will end this perfect day, time to eat and rest and pray. As night does fall, the dragon then rocks you back to sleep again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So today I've invited Scott Driscoll to read an excerpt from his original works. Now Scott has a very interesting background. He teaches at the University of Washington Educational Outreach in their literary fiction program. He won the Society of Professional Journalists First Place Award for Best Lifestyle Magazine Story of the Year. He was cited in Best of American Essays and he earned the very prestigious University of Washington Milliman Award for Fiction. He's also won first prize in the Literary Lights Fiction Contest. And Scott's work's been published in numerous literary journals. And his uh, story he's gonna read from today appeared in the X-Files, New Stories About Old Flames. So we're very glad to have Scott Driscoll here today. Thank you. And it will be thankfully short. I'm only going to read the, the beginning of a story so you won't have to listen to this for long. And it just so happens that this story is set in the Pike Place Market. And one of the main characters is a long time, was a long time resident of the market that won't necessarily be apparent in the, the beginning that we'll hear. Anyway, the story is called The Black Rhinoceros. Smoke hangs in a blue layered fog above her bed beyond the fan's reach. A stack of videos from the library bookmobile, All Wild Kingdom, has toppled into the bowl of goulash. Her bed is her world, and it's a mess. She won't look at me. She blows the smoke toward the open window. I'm inclined to apologize for snapping at her over the telephone when she woke me up, but the smell in her bedroom, a noisome melange of sour sweat, spoiled food, and dead ashes, holds me back. Do you realize it's two o'clock in the morning, I say. I had to kiss my daughter awake and tell her to call me at Marion's if the squirrels frightened her again, and to please not call her mom. There was no need to give her mother ammunition for a new hearing. Marion takes a drag on her brown moor cigarette. I don't care what time it is, she says. I want those pills tonight. She turns and studies me humorlessly. Her hair, set earlier today by the visiting nurse when she stopped in to replace the morphine patches, has fallen into a disarray of pewter spikes that sag limply into the pillow. The morphine undoes everything. Her eyes, her most striking feature, old oval instruments of surveillance, have sunk into the hooded shadows of her skull and taken on a feverish glaze. You seeing things again? We do the pill routine every time she gets fresh morphine patches, which gives her terrible hallucinations. Last night she swore she was on a ship. Every one of the men of her men were there, including Tommy, the son she hadn't seen or talked to in 17 years. Her visiting nurse and occasional cook, Kasia, a tall martinet from Poland, keeps the meds high on a shelf out of Marion's reach. A chart tracks what she takes. It's quite an assortment. Three kinds of morphine, Zoloft for elevating moods, nortiptyline to help her sleep, ibuprofen for swollen joints, DOS to soften stools, digoxin to slow her hammering heart. Kasha won't administer a lethal dose. Put on three tenors in concert. You hungry? Of course you are. You were born hungry. You can finish my goulash. 
Do you know how much trouble I can get into over this? See, this is what I'm telling you. It's always me, me, me. That's how come you're alone in that bunker and I can't get any peace before I die. Marion, why am I always defending myself to her? I moved my files into the garage so I could write briefs at home and wait for the school bus. You know very well that's what turned the trick at the hearing. I know damn well what turned the trick was me, and I say Queenie can be alone for five minutes. I need to be home when Queenie gets off the bus. The counselor said the afternoons are the worst. You know that. That's when teens get in trouble. You're too easy on her. Her mom's right about that, letting her wear dog collars. Don't go there, Marion. Go home to Queenie. I'll get the pills out of somebody else. Thank you. I think we're very lucky to have Christine Hemp with us today. Um, her writing has been heard on national public radio, and it's appeared in such publications as Harvard Magazine, the Boston Globe, and anthologies by Simon & Schuster. She was recently the first place recipient of a Northwest Society of Professional Journalists Award for her commentary and poetry. So people, will you please lend your ears to Christine Hemp. How do you do? Thank you for inviting me today. Um, as a poet, I've had some very diverse um, reading experiences and teaching experiences. And today, for your poem, I chose one that I wrote to the group that I worked with recently in London, England. I worked with the Metropolitan Police Force, all white cops, and youth offenders, all black kids, teenagers. And for a week, we wrote poetry as a kind of tool for crime prevention. Very wacky, it sounds very wacky. It was wacky, but by the end of the week, the kids said, I want to shake, shake these cops' hands. And the cops were writing poems about their families, the beat, the whole experience they had on the street. It was incredibly sobering, incredibly um, humbling experience to be able to work with these folks. And since then, I've back here in the States, I live in Port Townsend, and I worked with the Port Townsend police and the kids from the juvenile justice system there last fall and I'm on my way to Philadelphia next month to work with the Fidel Philadelphia police and some youth offenders there. So the poem that I'm going to read you today is the poem I dedicated to the kids and the cops in London. And it's called Window in the Wall. The only translation you might need to know is the word crisps, which of course are potato chips. And um, Smarties are sort of the equivalent of M&Ms in England. And the name of the poem is A Window in the wall. We look out at Brixton rooftops slick with rain. We shiver in the drafty room and scratch pens across paper. What is courage if not forming words for what will meet us on the street, in the pub, the darkened doorway? Words carve shapes out of the smoky haze. Crisps and candies crunch but our hands keep moving toward the wall between us. What we finally greet is not a lurking shadow, not the sound of a siren, nor a door slashed with blood, but a window. What kept us from seeing it before? The small frame peeling paint. It's open, letting in the air, letting in the light, the songs from either side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Scott, and I'm very happy to have Cody Walker here with me today. And he'll be reading his poem. Cody received an MFA in poetry at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville in 1995. And while in Arkansas, he taught poetry in the public schools as a writer in residence. He also taught writing and literature in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and Dae Jong, Korea. He served for five years as the theater and restaurant critic for the Olympian, and has published poetry and essays in a variety of magazines, newspapers, and textbooks. He currently teaches English at the University of Washington, where he is completing a doctoral dissertation on poetry and laughter. And this May, he joins the Seattle Arts and Lectures writers in the school program as a writer in residence. And I also found out today that he just got the award, so to speak, job, <laughs> job to write all the greeting cards for the Microsoft new edition of Publisher. 
So that's kind of a <laughs> little fun. <laughs> okay, thanks. Like that, that's where the buzz is created. <laughs> uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, this is a poem called Bozo Sapphics. Uh, Sapphic is a, uh, it's a four-line stanza associated with the Greek poet Sappho of about 2,700 years ago. Uh, each of these uh, stanzas has its own title. Bozo Sapphics. Bozo, toe to toe, tilt the glass, the terrorist turns to freedom fighter. Likewise, clowns in the funhouse mirror stand as kings, self-interested theories on which Bozo calls bull. Bozo's imbroglio. Showmen offered tenderness tend to take it. Husbands know this. Tickle a clown, does he not laugh? Then why subpoena him? Why inflict more pricks on this Bozo? Bozo, woe. Bozo's six apologies, five excuses, four rebuffs, and three switcheroos are met by two deaf ears. Behaviorists gather, call this first order clowning. Rebozos. Scarves of ample length that are brightly dyed and chiefly worn by Mexican women. Not a further bozo. Not an attempt at cloning. Shudder to think it. Bozo quid pro quo. Names he knows. Our bozo can cough up names till cows croak. Ask for names in return, however. Same old, same old. Bundle in old high German. Big mouth in Latin. Bozo utters a bon mot. Asked about increasingly vitriolic spats regarding comedy's tragic center, bozo cries, ridiculous quibber dicking, ha ha ha, weeping. Bozo incognito. He's the older guy in the hat. Or wait, the Latin fellow, cane and corsage, about to pay his tab. Or bartender Joe. Good Jesus. Everywhere. Bozo. Thanks. Thank you. We'll begin with uh, Wordsworth. Who, uh, was curated by uh, Elizabeth Scott. And Elizabeth, would you like to introduce our poet today? Thank you. Um, yes, I'm very excited that Sky Kathleen Moody is here, and she's the author of two nonfiction books and five mystery novels. And her first book, Hillbilly Woman, was based on her experiences as a freelance journalist covering social issues, and it won the 1974 Mademoiselle Woman of the Year Award. And it was also adapted for stage in New York City. Her second nonfiction book, Fruits of Our Labor, received the National Endowment for the Humanities President's Grant. And in 1969, her mystery novel, Rain Dance, was a finalist in the, for the Spotted Owl Award. She recently published K Falls, a Pacific Northwest mystery. And interestingly enough, Sky was a bush guide in Africa, which is the impetus for many of her um, stories relating to the environment. And she's going to be reading Debutante Season or Mardi Gras, New Orleans. Okay. Thank you very much. Just one small correction. Sorry. <laughs> that wasn't 1969. It was 1994. There are copies of this poem and another poem up on um, the podium if you're interested in following along. She sat snipping debutantes, Rex and Comus, whites only photographs, vital statistics from the Times Picayune gingerly placing one atop another, two neat piles, Rex and Comus, Comus and Rex, Comus, Comus, Comus. Is this girl Rex or Comus? She asks Arabelle, former Deb from Junior Plague, misanthropic sister in sorority and secret cruise. Arabelle replies, Oh, Biddy, I don't remember. They alternate, you know, from year to year. I think she's Rex. Anyway, Jed looked at the paper this morning, and he said, they're all either black or pigs. Biddy, the snipper, clips around the blacks. They aren't real Debs anyway, she muses. And if you read their bios, you'll see that 95% are fatherless. Uh-huh, that's right one parent in almost every case. Now this one, Biddy ruminates over a vanilla blonde. Do you suppose they named her Felicity after the street, or is it a family name? 
Arabelle strains forward across her own magnificent knees to study Felicity. Her coffee cup clinks, bone cup to bone saucer. No one in New Orleans can set a cup quite like Arabelle. Oh, bat, Felicity. Arabelle curls her delicate upper lip. I think there's some rather special story attached to her naming, but no details jump right out just now. Biddy the Clipper purses her thinning ex-deb lips, snips and snips and snips and snips. At last, all the white debs lie one upon another in neat comus and rec stacks where white debs belong. The black debs, a string of paper doll cutouts, cling to each other, tumble head over heels from Biddy's deft dangling fingers into the recycle scraps. Biddy studies her diamonds. I miss the days when married couples lacked familiarity, she murmurs. All this intimacy spoils an individual's identity. Clank. Bone on bone signals tacit agreement. Arabelle sighs. I find it all rather tiresome. But never mind. I think it's time for a new ball gown. Yes, that's it. I need a new ball gown. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Scott, and I'm very happy to introduce John Olson. He's the author of Echo Regime, and it's a full collection of poetry from Black Square Editions. His literary criticism has appeared in numerous journals and weeklies, including The American Book Review, Rain Taxi, and The Stranger. He is currently working on a nonfiction book about writing implements, and he teaches poetry part-time at the University of Washington. Thanks very much. And he'll be reading The Map. John? Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I want to thank the City Council for inviting me to participate in the Wordsworth series, series uh, today. And uh, I, I'm going to read a prose poem. It's about two to three minutes long, and, and it's not about pottery, unfortunately. Uh, it's about genetics. Um, it's, it's a work that emanated from, grew out of the uh, exhibit currently on display at the, uh, the Henry Art Gallery, uh, which is called Genesis, uh, the Human Genome Project. And this poem, it's called My Map, uh, is a poem in which I decided to map my own human genome. Uh, partly in, uh, it's largely satirical because of uh, my reading about what's called genetic determinism, the idea that, that not just our hair color and eye color, et cetera, et cetera, are determined by our genes, but our behavior as well, uh, which I find somewhat unsettling. And so that's essentially what this poem is about. My map. Let me tell you about my map, my genetic map. Over here is Mount Predilection, and over here is Lake Peculiarity. This is the hyperborean flower garden of my great neurotic lilies, and my subtle obsessive mosses, my melancholy babies, and my electromagnetic begonias. Here we have a Polynesia of jingled personal wounds, and this is an archipelago of contradictory ganglia. Here is an archway embellished with small carvings of extraordinary impulses. Thousands of blocks of stone etched with careless remarks and imprudent gestures await enactment in the hall of foolhardy acts. They survived air raids, poachers, and Martha Stewart. This is the rock of abnormality. It is burned in a kiln of indulgence to produce hydrocarbon and peals of laughter. This is a gene for brooding, and this is a gene for lewd and indecent body hairs. This is a gene for pausing to stare out of a window, and this is a gene for enhancing thickets of industrial indolence. These are my caverns of regret, and this is my swamp of remorse. This is a spiral of chromosomal chamber music, and this is a fragment of celebrity DNA going haywire in a Macedonia of kinship roots. This is my capacity for confusion, and this is my genetic code for translating bubbles as they dance on the edge of oblivion. Here is the inner Mongolia of my predisposition to seclude myself from the twisted iron of history, and this huge expanse of glittering jelly is the aral sea of my candy-colored volatility genes. Here is my aptitude for fruit, my penchant for indirection, my twin blue socks, and my ancestral irises. 
my uncanny knack for getting lost and my acidic disposition toward Florida lemons. This is my tropic of delinquency, and this is my continent of growth and continence. This is the land of the ordinary nose, and this is the land of the normal adolescent fears. This is my Botswana of biodiversity, and this is a grove of fever trees. This is a pool of Swedish genes, and this is a Kaluga sturgeon filled with 400 pounds of caviar. This is my Cretaceous half century of caterwauling, and this is my Mozambique of big browsers and high expectations. This is a gene for never remembering to buy batteries, and this is a gene for bad ideas. This is a gene for going to market, and this little gene ran all the way home with a dark parka of molecular relics. This is a pyrimidine, and this is a tranquil bay. This is a fertile bottomland, and this is a rocky outcrop of empty slabs of fate. This is a family tree, and this is a fragile thread of Africa. This is the sea of metamorphosis, and this is a barge of junk DNA. Thank you. Thank you. Today, we're happy to have April Caron. Actually, I, have, I realize I haven't pronounced your last name yet. Is it Caron? Mm -hmm. uh, April Caron with us. And uh, April is Elizabeth's last uh, selected poet uh, for this last six months. Uh, Elizabeth wanted to express her thanks to the committee and to Nick in particular for allowing her to curate this last six months worth of Wordsworth poets. Um, April attended elementary, junior, uh, elementary school, junior high, and high school in Central California, actually. She joined the Army. She graduated from Oregon State University, worked for the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration on the NOAA ship Rainier and graduated from the University of Washington Extension with a certificate from the Advanced Commercial Fiction Program. Today, she's a writer and poet, a teaching assistant at the UW Extension in the Commercial Fiction Program, and as she says, to keep the mortgage paid and her three dogs in kibble, she is an auto property damage adjuster for Pemco Insurance Company. So ladies and gentlemen, please lend your ears to April Caron. Well, I'd like to thank the committee for giving me this opportunity and um, the UW. This poem's called Coming Home. Once I was forced to leave my home, the giant oaks, the blonde grass, the rolling hills. My soul cried out for these, but they were no more. The screech owl's silent flight and nerve-rending calls were lost. The lake with its shady shores and sun-dappled water was drained. The fig tree whose sweet fruit and presence amidst the oaks was always such a mystery it was gone. My mom and dad sitting under the catalpa trees in the simmering heat as they waited for my friends and I to return for gathering the horses were torn asunder. For many years, I wandered and searched for a new home, from the hardwood forested hills of Kentucky to the Loblolly pine flats of Georgia, to the warm azure waters of the Persian Gulf and the Shillikoffs rooting icy gray majesty. In my travels, I met many people and saw many sights, but still couldn't find a place called home. It, then in the marshy muskeg, with its wind-sculpted yellow spruce overlooking the deep, iceberg-laden waters of Prince William Sound, I finally understood that while what is torn asunder can never be recreated, new roots could be nurtured and grown. The madrone trees hanging over the magnolia bluffs beckoned to me as I stood on the Rainier's rail. While we slowly steamed through Shell Shoal Bay, the clang of the boys the cries of the sea lions all called out, you're close, you're close. Then one night in the fading light, I sat under the new crowned elder trees, the Snohomish River rushing past, my dogs gambling at my feet on the sandy reach. I knew this is where my roots would grow. I had found my home. And my compatriots at work asked me to read this one. It's very short. This is called 520. Stomach churning, hands tapping a staccato beat on the steering wheel. Teeth clenched, look at my watch. I've moved 10 feet. Change radio stations. Keep pushing the seek button. Running through the channels. AM, FM, nothing on. Move five feet forward. Glance at my watch, 20 minutes have passed. Up ahead, flashing lights can be seen. On the other side of the divide. Take a deep breath. Bruce Coburn was right. I, too, wish I had a rocket launcher so I could blow this traffic away. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.